Welcome to, to Mashpee. We are the town of Mashpee's Department of Natural Resources. Filipe Amu, Masipia. And we are the Mashpee Wampanoag Tribe Natural Resources Department. We're here at Santua Pond to take a deeper dive into how climate change affects water quality, and more specifically, how the water quality at Santua Pond is degrading. And we also hope to take a look at some of the cultural and historical components of the Santua Pond. And lastly, take a look at what efforts homeowners can do to reduce their footprint and nutrient input into Santua Pond and its watershed. Well, water is life, all right? Simply put, water is life. You shouldn't have to convince someone to save their life. We cannot, water is finite. We've got what water we're going to have is not going to be anymore. It has to just circulate through the system to clean itself up. Uh, people don't realize how connected nature, the natural world is. Animals, the birds, the fishes, the, the mountains, the seas, the bays, the rivers, they're all connected to one another. And we got these fancy houses right on the waters and the rivers. And those rivers, like, they're carrying that water into the ponds, into the bays, into the oceans, in, in, into every waterway that exists because they're all connected. Fuston O'Neill is a multidisciplinary engineering firm uh, located in the northeastern U.S. Uh, we work in a variety of different areas. Uh, Eric and I both work in uh, water and natural resources in particular, and we're doing a lot of work uh, throughout New England in climate resilience, including this project here in Mashpee. Mashpee was awarded a Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness Program action grant uh, by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, uh, specifically looking at adding climate resilience to Santuit Pond. And Santuit Pond has a history of harmful algal blooms. Uh, we know that with a changing climate and higher temperatures, a longer summer growing season, more intense rainfall events, we're likely to see even more algal blooms forming in future years. So the focus of this project was to look at ways in which uh, Mashpee could help to make the pond more resilient uh, to future climate conditions uh, and reduce incidence of algal blooms, uh, looking at a variety of different things, including uh, stormwater management and low impact development in the watershed, nutrient uh, control through bylaws and other mechanisms, and also public education and outreach around the subject. So um, Andrew Gottlieb, the Executive Director of the Association of Preserve Cape Cod, APCC is the Cape's uh, biggest and oldest environmental education and advocacy group. We have a focus on water quality, land use preservation, uh, climate change, and promote good land use practices and uh, backyards and, and landscapes across the Cape. What we're particularly concerned about as it relates to water quality, sort of the dual effects of increasing storm frequency and intensity, um, as well as warmer temperatures. And those two things have combined to create some of the water quality degradation that we've seen in ponds in Mashpee and across the Cape, in particular contributing to some of the toxic cyanobacteria blooms that have become the norm as opposed to the exception in Santuit and in a ever increasingly frequent occurrence in some of our other ponds. Yeah, I'm Dr. Brian Howes. I work for the School for Marine Science and Technology at University of Massachusetts Dartmouth. I'm a chancellor professor there. I'm also the director of the Coastal Systems Program, which was the program that oversaw all the technical work for Mashpee's Massachusetts Estuaries Project studies of the estuarine waters of Mashpee that set the targets for restoration of those. I've also worked for Mashpee in terms of shellfish for many years, in terms of judging <coughs> whether it was appropriate use, whether it would work, and how much nitrogen that might remove. And we've done other work in, in the Quashnet River as well and, and certain watershed projects. Yeah, cyanobacteria are kind of interesting in that they're, the, the other word for them, they used to be called blue-green algae 
because they're fight, blue-green phytoplankton. Then, they, then the, more properly, they're called, uh, they were called blue-green uh, bacteria, and now it's the popular term is cyanobacteria. Same thing. And what they are is they're not uh, eukaryotes. They're not, they don't have a cell wall. They're bacteria that fix, fix carbon using light. Cyanobacteria created the, the Earth sort of geochemistry as we know it two billion years ago because they're the first oxygen producers on the planet that then turned it absolutely reducing environment into an aerobic oxygen environment. All of the geochemical cycles existed two billion years ago because of cyanobacteria. So that was a good thing. The problem is right now is, is that because they're so competitive and so adapted to these environments that, that these bacteria but you really need to think of them really more as phytoplankton because they require light and back all bacteria, most bacteria don't require light. They require light to live and that they, they form blooms in ways that many phytoplankton do not. Hello, my name is Ashley Fisher. I'm the Director of Natural Resources for the Town of Mashpee. I'm here today to describe to you what has occurred in the Santuit Pond area and its watershed. Cyanobacteria, also called blue-green algae, are microscopic organisms found naturally in all types of water. These single-cell organisms live in fresh brackish, combined salt and fresh water, and marine water. These organisms use sunlight to make their own food. In high nutrient-rich waters, High in phosphorus and nitrogen environments, cyanobacteria can multiply quickly, creating blooms that spread across the water's surface. Cyanobacteria blooms form when cyanobacteria, which are normally found in water, start to multiply very quickly. Blooms can form in warm, slow-moving waters that are rich in nutrients from sources such as fertilizer runoff or septic tank overflows. Cyanobacteria blooms need nutrients to survive. The blooms can form at any time, but most often in the late summer months or in early fall. So several years ago, Mashpee was one of the communities across the Commonwealth that participated in a Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness Program planning grant. And through that planning grant process, uh, the town identified priorities uh, to make the community more resilient to the impacts of climate change. One of the uh, high priority items was addressing the water quality conditions in Santuit Pond. Santuit Pond has a long history of being impacted by uh, harmful algal blooms or cyanobacteria. Uh, and that's sort of that, that greenish scum and, you know, um, sort of like sometimes can look like wet paint, can look like sort of different things on top of the pond. And it impacts water quality, uh, potentially has public health effects for people, also in impacts aquatic life within the pond. Uh, Santuit Pond's history with cyanobacteria blooms uh, goes back a few decades now. It was actually one of the ponds that was chosen as a monitoring site by the Massachusetts Department of Public Health when they received a grant from the Centers for Disease Control to look at the effects of cyanobacteria uh, in, in water bodies in Massachusetts. So a long history of water quality impacts from cyanobacteria at Santuit. Um, as a result of that, and knowing that cyanobacteria is something that is likely to increase uh, with a changing climate, warmer temperatures, more intense rainfall, um, it was really critical that the town start to act to address those issues by limiting nutrient input into the pond uh, and doing that in, in several different ways. Uh, stormwater management being one of them, dealing with on-site septic systems uh, being another, uh, increasing awareness around water quality and the relationship between water quality and, um, and uh, climate change and actions that folks can take in their own communities. 
Uh, although the focus of this grant is on Santuit, these practices and these ideas are really relevant for every water body uh, in Mashpee and every water body on the Cape as well, because uh, we know that under changing climate conditions, we're likely to see an increase in harmful algal blooms as well, along with other water quality problems also. Um, this project was a, uh, identified as an action grant, so it came out of the priority uh, pri list of priority projects from the planning grant. The town uh, worked with Fuss and O'Neill uh, and also the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe to uh, put together and submit an action grant to the state of uh, Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Uh, they were awarded that grant, and this is the project that we're working through now. Yeah, so one of the problems that we have, whether there's, there's significant climate change right away or not, if we have warm years, we already know the, that, <clears throat> that we get ice out earlier, we get phytoplankton then can grow in our ponds and in, in our macroalgae, in our estuaries, can start growing earlier because they get better light penetration. It's all light thing. So you think, well, it's warmer, isn't that causing the problem? Well, yeah, it is, but it's also the fact that they can start growing earlier because there's nothing impeding the light penetrating into the water column. So what happens is, is you get a much longer growing season. If you have a longer growing season, then you can start accumulating more and more phytoplankton or macroalgae in the bottom, and then you can generate a bloom because blooms, the, the species that cause the blooms are there all the time. It's a question of picking winners and losers. So some that can start early and can start accumulating many of them then cause a very large bloom, which can be very detrimental to the system. If it's, if it's just a green or some other type of, of phytoplankton that isn't toxic or anything, it's a problem because the bloom then generates a lot of organic matter which falls to the bottom, which causes low oxygen conditions, which we can talk about, we'll talk about in a second. If there's cyanobacteria and you have a large bloom, well then, <clears throat> then we're not talking about necessarily an ecological effect, as you're talking about an ecological effect, same thing, a lot of organic matter, low oxygen, but you're also talking about human health. You're talking about people not able to use the environment, They're, the beach is closed, they can't go fishing, they can't go wading, and that, that has a, 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 a really negative effect on citizens of Cape Cod because we're so out in the environment all the time and we have a touristic economy, they're out in the environment all the time. If we start losing our beaches, that's a real significant economic problem to us. But the ecological problem is the same for cyanobacteria and for regular uh, phytoplankton. The relationship between um, that nutrient loading and temperature is much the same as what you would experience when you try and get a plant to grow in a greenhouse. Put it in a warm environment. Um, and when you put it in a warm environment and you add food and you add water, obviously, um, you create growing conditions that allow the situation that we've experienced to, to become more commonplace. We've tended to see after heavy rainstorms an increase in the frequency of these algal blooms because all that fertilizer, all that nutrient that's accumulated on the roadway um, in these significant, short, heavy rate rainfall events that have become more and more typical um, as a result of climate change, those wash a lot of that nutrient load directly into the pond, provide a quick food source, kind of like a sugar high. My name is uh, Tavita Cap, and I am a senior at uh, Mashpee High School. Climate change can promote these uh, cy cyanobacteria blooms by the increasing of air temperatures, which also increases the temperature of water. Well, the biggest, really, climate change is, is occurring, but the question is, is how fast and how much? So it's more right now projecting forward. We start seeing changes, but one of the problems is people ascribe everything to climate change, but you have to sort of form the linkage. Ah, the Santua Ponds. You know, this place has a great cultural significance for us and our people. Isn't that right, Rob? Yeah, it definitely does. Um, the first Native American church in America was actually built here in 1684. Really? You aren't talking about Old Indian Meeting House that's on Meeting House Road right here in Mashpee, are you? Actually, I was. Um, the first Indian Meeting House was built over there at Brian's Neck. 
before it was um, transported to the meeting house at its location that it sits now. Really? That's cool. Now, is there any significance culturally for our tribe before the early settlers arrived? Well, there was an abundance of natural resources here for our ancestors. Really? How so? Uh, well, there was wild game everywhere. Uh, inside the pond, trout, eel, yellow perch. And let's not forget the spring migration of herring every year that come and spawn. Um, Santuart means place of the sachems. So this was an area also where sachems and cheese could congregate and trade goods. Wow, Jason, that's awesome. And I'm glad you mentioned herring because herring are a great form of sustenance for our people. And they're a great way for us to culturally connect to our ancestors. And, you know, that's why it's, it's very important for us to improve our water quality here at Santua Pond. You know, not just for us, but for our community as a whole. Isn't that right, Rob? I agree, Dale, because um, during the summer times, these toxic algae blooms in Santua Pond get really bad, and they start affecting the um, water quality of everything around here. So we should start focusing on it. That's true. And as a tribe, you know, we're not only losing uh, a part of our cultural identity, but our history as well. And um, you know, the community as a whole is also uh, in danger of losing a, a precious natural resource that we, we, we may never get back. One important part that's important to the tribe is that it was one of the largest areas of winter habitation for the tribe in this area. Um, there's still a lot of archeological sites along that sent to a pond. For me, it was more of a um, learning experience for me. Um, I was always in the woods with my dad, uh, learning about different roots and different berries and what to eat and watching the water. Uh, it was a real educational thing for me uh, to be on the pond and see how it was thriving when I was a kid. And then when I was a teenager, it started to slowly uh, die. And where I grew up and then had children and brought my children there to camp out every year. And now we can't use the pond at all. We pretty much spent the whole summer down on the pond. And the pond then you could, if you were out in a boat, you could look down and see the fish swimming underneath you. I mean, it wasn't anything like anyone here knows now and then we'd go down there for heron too um, we'd use the broom factory control the boards so that the herring would get stuck and then we'd throw them up on the bank and then we'd walk home with herring Cyanobacteria is the problem now, um, and the phosphorus that comes from the septic systems is the main pollutant, even though nitrogen is also one of the pollutants that comes from it. But I mean, that feeds the cyanobacteria, and once the cyanobacteria reach a certain point, then they're not going to be... I've seen the pond so thick with cyanobacteria that it's like pea soup. I think legislation and, and, and the tribe working with the government and working with the federal government as, as well as with the local government and, and the state government and putting all their resources together and coming up with a way that they all work for that same one end result, cleaning the water. You can't tell me that we can't clean the water because we can. Every bog that we have taken out of pro production is a step in the right direction. But with ag, you got, what I mean, the lawns, 
the fertilizers, the runoff, all fixable, all fixable. It's just a matter of desire. thing people can do is on, from a homeowner basis is stop fertilizing your property. Um, it's totally within your control. It doesn't cost you anything. In fact, it saves you money. Um, a unfertilized lawn doesn't contribute to water quality problems, doesn't require you to spend money on fertilizers and herbicides, um, doesn't require you to spend money getting that lawn mowed. Um, so financially, it's better for the homeowner um, and it improves the quality of the pond. At APCC, we have a lot of information on our website, apcc.org, that gives tips to homeowners on how they can minimize their impact on water quality, regardless of where they live, but especially if they live close to freshwater ponds. With the ecosystem, it's able to recover itself very quickly and efficiently. But if there's a lack of that biodiversity, then it can't recover as well as it could have. And it might go to a point where it can't recover at all. Well, some ways that you can identify these poor water quality in the pond is with uh, some visual cues. And some of these visual cues are um, the color of the pond. It can look like a green, like kind of like a pea soup kind of color. And um, another thing is by the smell of the pond. If you, you know, some of the ponds doesn't smell very nice, it kind of has that um, sulfur-like smell to it. And what we know is, is that it is the phosphorus levels in the pond, uh, particularly relative to the nitrogen levels in the pond, that tip the balance from just normal phytoplankton, your every, everyday phytoplankton, to, to cyanobacteria, which of course can produce uh, toxins, which are toxic to not only, well, to mammals. And we're a mammal, so it's toxic to us. Neurotoxins and other toxins. And that's why when people go out there and they can see, see the green. When you can see the green, it's too late to think about saving the pond. It's talking about restoring the pond. My name is Kristen Andres. I'm the Associate Director for the Association to Preserve Cape Cod. A rain garden is simply a garden planted in a shallow depression that receives stormwater. And typically in a residential setting, the stormwater is going to be roof runoff from a gutter downspout. The rain garden will accept the stormwater and slow it down and allow it to infiltrate into the ground around the root systems of the plants that are planted there. So it helps purify the water, um, the soils grab hold of any contaminants, and the plants and the soil organisms help um, take up nutrients. You don't want water to be standing for any extended period of time. The water should be able to infiltrate. The other extremely important key uh, part of a rain garden is the native plants uh, because of their extensive root systems. And around each of those little root, rootlets uh, is an air pore or an air space, and that's what allows the rainwater to soak into the ground efficiently. And that rainwater then not only hydrates the plants, but it hydrates the soil organisms that then help the plants take up the nutrients. So native plants are really important to include in a rain garden because many of our native plants are drought tolerant. And of course, they're adapted to our soils. Uh, they can do very well from that, those periods of drought to deluge when we do have a big rainstorm. And native plants also support local food webs. Um, they're going to support pollinators like wild bees and butterflies and not only support them with pollen and nectar but as part of their life cycle. And then in turn they also support birds. So birds that eat the insects and birds that might uh, consume the, the seeds of the native plants in the winter. We are losing the battle, but 
we're still in the game. So we might as well try to do what we can to improve what we can. It takes being unified to do this properly. As I indicated earlier, I don't want to be repetitive. But Mashpee can't do just this alone. The tribe has to be part of it, and more than that. The state has to be part of it, and more than that. And the federal government has to start coming up with some funds to do this, because we're not the only ponds and rivers and lakes that, that are getting you know, like they are. Ha it's happening everywhere. Low Impact Development, or LID, is really a set of uh, strategies and practices that are designed to help um, sites mimic natural hydrology and also to protect and improve water quality. For Santuit Pond, um, the majority of the land use around the pond is residential, so homeowners can play a big part in implementing uh, LID practices on their own property. Uh, and that again, that consists of uh, practices such as implementing uh, rain barrels to capture the, root, the run, uh, runoff from their roof um, rooftops. And they can do things like um, m minimizing their lawn area and also reducing the amount of fertilizer, uh, herbicides and pesticides that are used on their property, again, to uh, really reduce the amount of pollutants that are generated from their, their lots. Uh, another uh, major source of stormwater to Santuit Pond is the network of roads uh, in the neighborhoods around the pond. Um, so, so the roads uh, convey stormwater from uh, people's homes, their driveways, uh, their lawns, and that stormwater that's generated ends up going into catch basins, which are located in the road. Um, one of the issues with the catch basins is that they tend to become covered with leaves and sediment as they collect um, that runoff over time. And if they're not maintained frequently, what can happen is that uh, the stormwater can tend to bypass those catch basins and, and, and go downhill, eventually ending up in, in the pond itself. So a, a, an important practice that both the town and residents can, you know, can, can do is to make sure that those storm drains are cleared. Uh, the grate should be cleared. Um, if there are leaves and debris covering them, then obviously the stormwater can't get into them. You know, so, so one of the um, practices is for the town or, or homeowners who see a clogged drain to simply take the, the leaves and the debris off of that you know, ahead of a storm or if you know that there's a, a major you know, rain event coming so that the, the storm drains in the road can actually function as they were designed to capture that stormwater runoff. Uh, many of the catch basins in Mashpee and around Santuit Pond are what's known as infiltrating or leaching catch basins, which means they have an open bottom or they have holes inside the structure that allows stormwater to actually infiltrate into the ground. Um, so that really reduces the volume of runoff and the pollutants that make their way to the pond. Uh, but again, if they're covered in leaves, those structures simply can't do their job and runoff tends to you know, pass by them and, and end up down creating, causing road flooding or uh, uh, pollutants that are, are, are entering into the water body directly from either overland flow or erosion you know, caused by simply too much water accumulating at the low point. So another uh, important thing to take into account is that we're thinking about how future climate is going to affect water quality and also stormwater management. And one of the things that we know is that current climate projections indicate that here in Massachusetts, uh, we're going to be seeing more rainfall on an annual basis, and not just more rainfall, but also more days of heavy rain and more intense rainfall events. And what happens with that is that um, those heavy, intense rainfall events are able to mobilize or wash off the land surface, more sediment and more pollutants, more nutrients, uh, so that exacerbates any sort of water quality issues that we already have. Um, so that increasing precipitation and planning for that, both in how we um, address our current, um, sort of our current way that we deal with stormwater, but also think about how we manage stormwater in the future, how we should um, size stormwater management controls becomes very important because we want uh, them to last. Health concerns associated with cyanobacteria blooms vary depending on the type of cyanobacteria, the route of exposure, and the amount of cyanotoxins present within the species of cyanobacteria. Ingestion is the primary concern, since ingesting small, even small amounts of cyanobacteria can, can cause gastrointestinal symptoms.
but larger amounts can cause liver damage or neurological damage. Contact with cyanobacteria can cause skin or eye irritation. Inhaling water spray containing cyanobacteria can cause asthma-like symptoms or breathing problems. Small children and pets are more susceptible to these effects of cyanotoxins, and they're the, the ones we need to be concerned about around the water at Santua Pond. The Mass Department of Public Health has guidelines for evaluating the presence of cyanobacteria and microcystin in the water bodies used for recreation. Since 2008, the Mass Department of Public Health has recommended that individuals be advised not to contact the water when a visible scum layer is present. The total cyanobacteria cell count exceeds 70,000 cells per milliliter, or the microcystin levels equal or exceed eight parts per billion. These recommendations are typically made to the local health department, which issue the advisory. Citizens of Mashpee can also contact the Department of Natural Resources that does take weekly cell counts within Santuit Pond and other freshwater ponds in town. The first step any individual should take is if they see a cyanobacteria bloom or a scum layer, to please avoid contact with water. If it's green, don't go in. Also pay attention to postings on the water. The Mashpee Department of Natural Resources and the Mashpee Department of Health will post an advisory when the cyanotoxin blooms reach above the threshold set by the Massachusetts Department of Health. The Department of Natural Resources tests each and every fresh water body starting in the spring months when the water temperatures start to rise. We will go out and take visual inspections of areas of public access points around the pond, look for scum layers that may be present and indicative of a cyanobacteria bloom. If there's discoloration in the water, if there's particulates floating in the water, we will make note and take a separate sample to analyze for number per milliliter of cyanobacteria species. Once that number reaches above the threshold set by the Mass Department of Public Health, we will issue an advisory posting. You can also find the advisory posting on the town website under the Department of Natural Resources or the Department of Health. The Barnesville County Department of Health also collects samples for fecal coliform or E. coli sampling. When the bacteria levels do reach or exceed the threshold, there will also be a posting posted for a closure notice to swimming. Pay attention to those postings on the water as well. If you have any questions as to whether you should swim in a body of water, when in doubt, stay out and contact your local health department.